All right, I think that this is recording. Yes, okay. Um, so welcome to Abnormal Psychology. This is kind of a weird way to be doing the first lecture, um, but it's gonna be a sort of weird semester and we'll kind of all work together to make the best of it, I guess. Um, so I'm Dr. Zikraf, I'm gonna be your professor this semester and um, probably most of you will watch this after we've already met in our first um, class meeting on Zoom on Tuesday, but in case we haven't, um, good to meet you. Whew, okay, so the first three lectures in this class are not going to cover um, any specific form of psychopathology. They're going to be more background lectures. And just to let you know right now, they're covering a lot of material and some of it might be a little bit dry. Um, in the syllabus, I said to skim the first, I believe, four chapters. Um, you don't have to necessarily read any of it in depth. The most in-depth of the first four chapters I'd recommend reading is chapter two, where um, it covers a lot of like neuroanatomy and brain structures, and we'll get to that in the next lecture. Um, but for this lecture, the, the objective is just to give you kind of a sense of where our modern theories of psychopathology come from, um, what our historical understanding has been of human abnormal behavior. Um, so kind of how we got to where we are today. So this is what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk first about just overall how we currently define psychopathology and how psychopathology has been kind of always defined throughout European history, at least. Um, then we're going to run through three different historical perspectives, although not in this order. Um, we're going to talk about spiritual explanations for psychopathology physical explanations, and then finally, psychological explanations. And then the lecture will end with an introduction to integration. So the idea that, um, the idea of multiple pathways to psychopathology, integration is kind of where we are today with our modern understanding of psychopathology. We know that for basically every mental illness we're gonna talk about this semester, there is no one single cause. You can't pin down a specific physically um, explanation or a specific psychological explanation. Um, most types of psychopathology have many different causes um, and two cases of the same mental illness don't necessarily have the same root cause. So that's what we'll get into with integration at the end of today's lecture and then cover in a lot more detail um, in Thursday's lecture. So first, we're going to talk about defining psychopathology. And the textbook um, talks about four Ds of psychopathology. So deviance, danger, dysfunction, and distress. So each of these four things um, can be present in a person's behavior that makes it psychopathology. But as we'll talk about, um, they don't all four have to be present for something to be considered psychopathology. And in the discussion board, one of the prompts is for you to just think about cases where maybe all four are present, but psychopathology isn't present. So the first D is for deviance. Um, and when you're trying to decide if a behavior is pathological, you have to ask yourself if it makes sense, if it is kind of rational and logical or appropriate within the person's cultural and social context. So this picture is um, from March 2020, and at almost any other time in history, walking around with a water bottle on your head would be really weird, and it would probably be a sign that maybe you're mentally unwell. But in that specific time in America, there was a shortage of masks, there was a pandemic happening, so people were being creative about ways to keep themselves safe, and wearing a water bottle on your head actually wasn't a particularly deviant thing to do. It made sense in social context. So when we're thinking about deviance um, and when we're thinking about an individual person's behavior being deviant, we have to think about their customs and their norms. So an example of this might be nudity. Um, there's nothing inherently deviant about nudity, but showing up to class naked would be really weird behavior because it goes against our customs of how we attend class. Um, our social norms of when it's appropriate to be naked. So being naked in class is a really different behavior than being naked at a nudist resort or in your bathroom or in a gym locker room. Um, 
We also, when we're considering whether someone's behavior is deviant, we have to take into account their belief system. So an example of this might be um, speaking in tongues. If a person, let's say a client, a patient, comes from a religious background where speaking in tongues is a common practice, they're doing that practice isn't necessarily a sign of anything wrong. It's not deviant in their cultural, social context and their belief system. But if someone who isn't from that type of religious background suddenly starts um, speaking in tongues, speaking in not in an understandable language and claiming that, that God is talking through them, if they don't have a history of believing that, um, if it's not consistent with their background, their customs and their norms, then it might be a sign that something is wrong. So the next D is for danger. And when we're evaluating behavior to see whether it's pathological, we ask if it puts the person, so the person doing the behavior or people around them at risk. So some examples of um, dangerous behavior in psychopathology would be um, people with eating disorders experiencing malnutrition because of self-starvation, self um, people with hoarding disorder living in unsafe conditions, um, substance abuse by definition is dangerous because there's a risk of overdose, physical dependence, um, physical harm. Um, but there are tons of behaviors that are dangerous to yourself and other people that aren't necessarily indicative of psychopathology. So the picture is someone climbing Mount Everest. Um, and that is a really dangerous thing to do. Um, when you climb Mount Everest, you're risking your own life and also risking other people's lives. Um, people who climb Mount Everest climb over the dead bodies of other climbers all the time. Um, but wanting to climb Mount Everest, putting yourself in danger to do that, isn't a sign of psychopathology in and of itself. It's dangerous, but it's not necessarily deviant, not necessarily distressing, and not necessarily dysfunctional. So dysfunction or psychosocial impairment is the third D. Um, and when you're evaluating a person for psychopathology, you ask if their life is being negatively affected by the behaviors or the symptoms that they're coming into treatment with or being assessed for. So the three main domains of psychosocial impairment that we think about are social impairment. Um, does the behavior or the symptoms get in the way of friendships, of um, sort of typical activities? So if you're a college student, does it get in the way of hanging out with other people in your dorm? Does it get in the way of joining clubs or um, fraternities and sororities if that's something that you want to do? There's also family impairment. So does it interfere with the person fulfilling their role in the family? If they have kids, is it interfering with their parenting? Is it interfering with their romantic relationship? Is it interfering with their relationship with their parents or siblings? Um, or we can also ask if the behavior doesn't necessarily cause distress to the person doing the behavior, we can ask if it causes distress to their, their family and the people that love them. And then lastly, we can ask if the behavior causes impairment at work. So is it getting in the way of them fulfilling their role as either a worker or a student? Is it preventing them from studying? Is it preventing them from learning? Is it preventing them from being on time to work? Is it putting them at risk of failing classes or getting fired? So the last and um, from a clinical perspective, arguably the most important D is distress. Um, and basically that's just, does the symptom bother the person who's experiencing it? Do they want it to stop? Um, there are some psychological disorders where distress alone isn't enough and we have to ask, is the distress proportional? So an example of that would be if someone is incredibly sad and depressed after losing someone close to them. We consider bereavement, so grief, um, the loss of a loved one, to be kind of a normal reason to feel distress. So it, there's a lot of distress present, but it's not necessarily deviant. We would only um, consider someone who's grieving to be depressed if in our clinical judgment, the, the symptoms of depression kind of went above and beyond the distress that we would expect for someone in, in their position. So distress is usually the reason why people seek a mental health diagnosis. It's usually what brings people to treatment. Um, just, you know, the fact that the symptoms are bothering them and they want to get better. And in most cases in the DSM, with just a few exceptions, um, the person actually has to be experiencing distress for them to meet criteria for the diagnosis. Um, if someone has, for instance, hoarding disorder, um, even if their living conditions are unsafe, if they're not distressed, if it's not causing any dysfunction or impairment 
in their occupational functioning, their social functioning, or their family, technically they wouldn't meet criteria for hoarding disorder. They have to be distressed or impaired by it. Um, some examples where distress isn't required um, would be eating disorders. So eating disorders have pretty objective criteria that have to do with the degree of weight loss, the degree of self-starvation, and how much sort of physical damage the person is doing with their eating disorder. And distress doesn't have to be present to diagnose, for instance, anorexia nervosa, but that's an exception. Usually distress has to be present. Okay, I'm gonna take a little water break and then we're gonna talk about historical models of psychopathology. So we're talking about history because pretty much throughout written human history, and again, we're going to be focusing a lot on European history um, because that's had the, the strongest influence on our modern understanding of psychopathology in the US and in modern Europe. Um, throughout written Western history, people have recognized deviant, dangerous, dysfunctional, and distressing behavior as problematic and aberrant and as something that needs to be intervened on, um, either for the good of the person experiencing those behaviors or for the good of society. What hasn't always been the same over time is how most people sort of understood those behaviors to be caused, what people attributed the four Ds to. And our understanding of where behavior is coming from has implications for our ideas about how to treat it. So as I said, this class this particular lecture and probably most of the lectures are gonna focus a lot on European and American history. So first we're gonna cover spiritual models, um, which basically suggests that behavior characterized by the four Ds is caused by demons or um, evil spirits, ghosts. Um, it could be caused by a problem with the individual's soul. Um, so historically, when there's a spiritual understanding of psychopathology, there's usually a spiritual treatment um, and exorcisms have been a, a dominant spiritual treatment. Um, however, there have been some religious traditions throughout European and American history that reject exorcism, that don't believe in it. And one example of this was American Puritans. So American Puritans didn't believe in exorcism, a lot of them were Calvinist, which meant that they believed that your soul was kind of already predetermined to be good or evil, to go to heaven or hell. So they didn't necessarily think that there was any treatment or cure for spiritual ailments. So cultures that thought about the soul that way, um, that didn't believe in exorcism, that didn't believe that the soul was something that could be changed or healed, tended to respond to mental illness with things like shunning or execution. And a lot of the women and few men who were killed during the witch trials in um, early colonial history. Some of them may have been demonstrating mental illness. And even the ones who we wouldn't today understand as having been mentally ill, in their cultural context, other Puritans may have seen them as mentally ill, but they believed that mental illness was caused by the devil or by having sort of an evil soul. Um, so they didn't necessarily treat mental illness. So a modern approach to spiritual models of psychopathology is faith healing, um, or sort of separate from faith, faith healing, praying for, praying for healing. There's kind of two categories of modern spiritual approaches to mental illness that I wanted to talk about. The first is um, charismatic gifts. So this is from Pentecostal Christian traditions. And the idea is that um, God can work through you to perform miracles or gifts, and one of them is healing. So faith healers will often um, attempt to channel God's spirit to heal both physical and mental ailments. And they'll often refer to a mental or physical ailment as a devil. So they'll talk about um, banishing the devil of alcoholism, for instance, from someone's body. Um, there's some stuff about that type of charismatic faith healing in the further reading at the end, and it's something that you can watch and talk about on the discussion board. Um, but probably a more mainstream spiritual understanding of psychopathology has to do with just praying for healing. And a lot of mainstream and evangelical Christians do this. 
um, praying for healing doesn't necessarily mean that you have a fully spiritual understanding of the origins of psychopathology. Um, but this video that I'm going to show is an example of modern American Christians articulating a spiritual understanding of a form of psychopathology. And we'll see if this video worried is. something could be wrong. He was not able to tell me what was going on. Um, instead of being able to communicate with me and tell me he, he was having a hard time or that he didn't feel well, he would just cry, you know, and then he would, he would bite himself, bite himself until he would bleed. The doctor referred them to a specialist who gave them the news they dreaded. He said, I'm sorry to tell you that looks like your son might have autism. Having the doctor tell me that he had autism was like a kick in the stomach. It's like the doctor handed us a sign, you know, and here's your sign. This is what you guys are going to have to deal with for the next rest of your life. One doctor told the Waldens Ethan would probably never speak. So I just want to jump in and say, I'm not sure if the audio of this video is being recorded in the lecture. If it's not, you can go back and, and watch it from where it starts. But in case it is, I just want to point out that the way that they're talking about autism is not how people with autism want the disorder to be talked about. Autism is a form of psychopathology. It's not a curse. It's not, it's not going to ruin your life. Um, this family is expressing a lot of stigma about autism. And that stigma is definitely playing into how devastated they were by the diagnosis. They're thinking of autism as something incurable, something that will really affect their son's character and personality, which isn't to say that having autism won't affect his life, but they're taking it as if he's been diagnosed with like cancer or an incurable illness, when really he's being diagnosed with a developmental disorder that will affect the way that he relates to the world and maybe the way he relates to other people but he's not gonna die from it. And a lot of people will, will react to this diagnosis as if their child is going to die from it. And autism self-advocates really consider that reaction to be very stigmatizing. So I just wanted to say that. So with little help or direction, they began to care for their son, but raising Ethan was exhausting and stressful and that strained their marriage. So there's a lot more arguments, a lot more disagreements. Um, I have my thoughts about what we should do. She has her thoughts about what we should do. Then one night they realized. I also wanted to point out, raising a child with autism isn't what's stressful. It wasn't what was straining their marriage. What was straining their marriage was not having enough help, not having enough knowledge and professional assistance in parenting a child with autism in the best way possible. So having a child with a developmental disorder can cause a lot of distress and dysfunction in the family. But in this case, a lot of the distress and dysfunction was coming from the fact that they, at the time, weren't getting adequate treatment from professionals. They were up against something more. Gina says she had a vision of a dark presence in her son's room. She woke up in a panic. I remember getting up, I ran down my hallway, and I, I ran into Ethan's room, and I just fell on the floor, and I just, I just cried. I cried my eyes out. I pick her up off the floor and we start talking and, it, and something went off in my mind at that moment and in her mind that said, this fight is as much a spiritual battle as it is a physical battle. They realized only their faith in God could help them face the challenges of raising their son. So the next morning. Okay, so I'm going to stop it there. You can finish watching the video if you're interested in how it ends, just to let you know this is from the 700 Club. So it's actually produced by people who have a spiritual understanding of psychopathology. And as we'll talk about later in this lecture, modern understandings of psychology integrate psychological and biological understandings, but not spiritual understandings. That's not to say that there's anything wrong with that necessarily, but the tools of modern psychology can't really incorporate a spiritual understanding because it's not something that you can prove right or wrong with um, the scientific method. So, one last thing to say about that video is that the narrator sort of talks about the need to pray for help and guidance in coping with an autism diagnosis and in getting in help and guidance and finding appropriate treatment. That's not a spiritual model necessarily. That's just a person with religious beliefs asking for spiritual guidance and finding an appropriate biological and psychological intervention.
but the idea that autism represents a, a dark presence, almost a literal spiritual evil that was hovering over their kid, that was more of a spiritual understanding of the origins of psychopathology. Okay. They found an autism specialist. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So, as I said, psychological or spiritual models aren't really a part of modern clinical psychology. So we're gonna focus more on biological and psychological history in this lecture. So biological theories of psychopathology attribute distress, dysfunction, danger, and deviance in behavior to specific physical causes that you can actually pinpoint in the body. And the implication of that is that if you can pinpoint a specific physical cause, you can treat psychopathology by intervening on that specific physical cause. So some of the earliest biological theories actually of both psychology and physical medicine, um, they didn't really make a distinction between the two, uh, came from Hippocrates, who lived in the, um, before the Christian era, and Galen, who lived shortly after um, 0 AD. So Hippocrates and Galen were both um, Greek physicians. And they both moved away from a spiritualist approach and treated physical illness and mental illness as something that had an origin in the physical body. Hippocrates and Galen um, really influenced medieval European medicine and psychology. After the fall of Rome, um, European culture kind of collapsed for a while and the, the Dark Ages were really um, like around 900 AD, and then society started, started to kind of rebuild itself um, between 900 AD and 1500, which is around when the Renaissance started. And during that time, um, culture in the Middle East had not been as affected by the fall of Rome. So Middle Eastern physicians kept Hippocrates and Galen's teachings sort of alive and active and added their own teachings. So Hippocrates and Galen were reintroduced to Europe via the Middle East, and one of the most influential Middle Eastern physicians was Avicenna. So anyway, all that to say that Hippocrates and Galen lived a really long time ago, but because of the European Dark Ages, um, European culture and research was really set back, and their teachings remained really influential for a very long time. So one of their dominant teachings was humorism. And the idea of humorism is that um, our bodies contain four fluids that need to be in balance for us to be in good physical and mental health. So the idea of humorism is that the four Ds in behavior and also any physical illness, any physical symptom is caused by humoral imbalances. So having too much of one humor and too little of another humor. So common treatments using a humoral understanding um, were things like bloodletting, which got rid of blood. Um, which was associated with happiness, but when there was excessive blood, it might be associated with things like aggression, mania, fever in, on the medical side. Um, or emetics, which helped to get rid of bile um, by making someone vomit. So black bile was associated with aggression and anger, yellow bile with sadness. Um, and then the last tumor was phlegm or mucus, which was associated with apathy. Um, not all humoral treatments revolved, involved removing humors. They also used kind of external treatments like topical treatments, heat, massage, or uh, medicines like herbs to try to cause the body to produce or get rid of humors. Um, another biological treatment or sort of theory of psychopathology was that psych psychopathological behavior had its origins not in the balance of humors in the body, so not in these fluids that are kind of running through our bodies, but in a specific organ, the uterus. So all the way going back to Hippocrates, um, physicians described a disorder that affected women. Um, and it was sort of characterized by mood swings, emotionality, um, anxiety, physical symptoms like headaches and fatigue. Um, and again, emotional symptoms like anxiety, melancholy, agitation, 
Um, Hippocrates and many European physicians after him attributed hysteria to not having enough sex. So the idea was that the uterus gets inflamed or upset. Hippocrates actually thought it moved around the body if a woman wasn't having a quote unquote normal sex life with penetrative sex with a man. So from ancient Greece through the Victorian era, some of these symptoms in women, so agitation, mood swings, um, depression, and some physical ailments were treated with orgasm. Um, so women were recommended to make sure that they were having sex with their husband. Physicians weren't typically encouraging extramarital sex um, or sometimes through masturbation. So in the um, recommended further readings, there's an article about the history of medical masturbation. Um, some of you may have heard it sort of said that vibrators were invented by Victorian physicians who were tired of bringing women to orgasm with their hands and wanted to do it in a more convenient way. So they invented vibrators. That is looking like it's not true. Um, that theory has been kind of disproven by historians. But in the Victorian era, there was a belief that a lot of women's psychological problems were caused either by a lack of sex or more broadly. And this is kind of getting into a more psychological model. But women's mental illnesses were caused by not fitting into women's social roles, one of which was having heterosexual sex and being married. So a more modern example of a biological theory um, with a specific physical um, origin in the body had to do with lobotomies. So again, there's um, further recommended readings about the history of lobotomy. It's pretty fascinating. But basically, it's a physical treatment for psychopathology that was invented in the 30s. Um, and it was, met, it was believed to work by kind of just calming people's emotions. So just sort of tur turning down emotions, whatever negative emotion the person was experiencing. Um, it was commonly used to treat depression, um, but it was also used to treat like children, or not children, but behavioral problems. So maybe antisocial behavior, or maybe again, in the case of women, um, behavior that went against accepted gender norms. So the, the biological theory behind lobotomies was that by severing the corpus callosum and um, in the frontal lobe, this would help the brain regulate emotion better and kind of calm down, turn down emotions. So we're going to talk more about this in the next lecture, especially the frontal lobe. Um, but that's the part of your brain right behind your forehead, um, top and front of your head. And we know now that that part of the brain is really integral to things like planning ahead, um, logical, complex thought, exerting self-control, and yes, um, controlling your emotion. So emotion comes from other brain structures and the frontal lobe is the part of the brain that helps us exercise sort of conscious control over our emotions. It helps us not act on our emotions. It helps us calm ourselves down. So in that sense, lobotomists were right that that was what the frontal lobe does, but they were wrong in thinking that damaging it would help it work better. So the corpus callosum is the um, band of axon tracts, so fibers that connect the two halves of the frontal lobe and allow the two halves of the brain to communicate with each other. Um, and those were the two parts of the brain that lobotomy is targeted. So this is a video, um, an interview with Howard Dudley, who was one of the youngest people ever to get a lobotomy. And his lobotomy was performed transorbitally. So this was sort of an updated lobotomy technique that didn't require general anesthetic, and it could be performed as an outpatient procedure. Um, and it involved, without cutting into the skull, um, taking an ice pick, sticking it through someone's tear ducts into the orbital bone behind the eye, uh, where the, the bone is really thin, sticking it through and into the, the frontal lobe. So this is Howard Dilley talking about why he had this lobotomy, sort of what which of the four Ds were actually being treated here and what his life has been like since. So again, hopefully you can hear this. If not, I would recommend watching it yourself. And using them on people who by anyone's standards were perfectly normal. Hi there, Howard, I would guess. Hi, I'm Howard Dolly. Hello, I'm Michael Mosby. Glad to meet you. And you. So this is your sort of childhood neighborhood, is it? Yes, it is. This is the place. Which place the house? The house is over in here. What were you like as a child? Uh, 
Well, I wasn't an angel. I was uh, very rambunctious. Uh, I liked to roam the streets a lot. I liked to be alone. I found out if I was alone, I didn't get in trouble. Yeah. Because you know, no one was there to get me in trouble. Uh, and I just wanted to be left alone, pretty much. You know. Howard's mother died when he was just five years old. His father married again, but Howard and his new stepmother, Lou, had a very difficult relationship. I felt that she was trying to take the place of my mother, and I resented that, so. How did she respond? Uh, she would punish me or do things to me that would aggravate me, so it would just snowball. Once she did something to me, I'd do something back, and pretty soon it just got out of hand. Their relationship got worse and worse, to the extent that Lou took Howard to see Dr. Freeman. It was just before his 12th birthday. Yes. Dr. Freeman was the developer of the transorbital lobotomy, and he actually became really famous in the 50s for the procedure. He was kind of like a public intellectual, um, and he actually toured the country in a van giving people transorbital lobotomies just like off the street. So he was kind of a medical celebrity at the time. Do you think she had any appreciation of what a lobotomy would do? I don't know that she cared. I think that she uh, just wanted a solution to me. And whatever that solution brought, she was willing to accept. This picture shows Howard undergoing his lobotomy. I wasn't changed that much. But I would still have my faculties and things. I thought she was going to get more of a docile, uh, robotic type kid right. that she could control. If the lobotomy was supposed to pacify Howard, it failed. He became increasingly disruptive. Unable to manage him, his parents sent him away from home forever. I had gone to several people's homes and then made a ward of the court at Juvenile Hall. And since I didn't commit a crime, they sent me to Agnews at age 13, 14 years old. And I was put in with adult mentally ill patients. Right. I just was a kid that had no place to go is what they kept telling me. Right. We have no place to send you. And then I went back to Juvenile Hall, back on the streets, got in trouble because I didn't have any skills or know how to live. And uh, went back to Agnews till I was 20. It was either that or prison. Do you think Walter Freeman stole something from me? I think he took my childhood. I think he, he took my childhood and some of my adulthood because I'm probably about 20 years or better behind the average person. What I'd really like to do is I'd like to take you along an MRI machine where we can actually have a look inside your brain because I think it is extraordinary. I think you're an extraordinary individual and I'd be very, very interested in how you are and the MRI machine might reveal. Okay. Of the so we'll talk about this in, I think, the next lecture, but basically an MRI is a machine that enables um, doctors to take a picture of the structure of your brain. Um, the way that it works is using magnets that react with oxygen in the blood to help show the structures of the brain. Um, well, yeah, we'll talk more about that in the next lecture. 100,000 people who were lobotomized Howard is the first to have a high-resolution MRI scan. I feel privileged to be here. I've seen into parts of you that no one else has ever seen into. Ooh, right, take a seat over here. Take a foot. So we have had a good look at your brain. Oh, We've been there I are. Absolutely fascinating. This is the front of his head. This is his eyebrow, his eye, his nose would be over here, the back of his head. Uh, the knife uh, should have gone in above the eye. Right. Okay. And then you can see this black region here oh, is wow. not normal. That's abnormal. That is abnormal. Yes. Right. See inside my head, I have a black hole. <laughs> there you go. I got two of them. 
this way so this instead of moving to the side. These huge black cavities were created by Dr. Freeman's instruments. And on both sides? Both sides. Right. So what, is, what would that area normally be doing? So the frontal lobes are important for long-term planning, um, inhibition of a response. One of the most obvious things that people who have damage in this part of the brain is uh, they become very impulsive. Right. Uh, unable to control their impulses. And that's paradox, isn't it? They went through all that, they put you all through all that, and actually it was the exact opposite of what they were hoping to achieve. Right. It would have made you worse in a funny way. It would have made you much more likely to misbehave. Is that right? Yeah, I would, I would agree. Certainly if you did this to an adult, I would expect them to be permanently impaired and, and right. not be able to control their impulses. Ironically, it was probably Howard's youth that in the end prevented him from going completely off the rails. His young brain was able to rebuild pathways responsible for impulse control, and which govern reasonable behavior. The tragedy is that when Howard was operated on in 1960, safer and more effective psychiatric treatments were widely available. Nonetheless, Freeman went on performing lobotomies for many more years, only stopping when he was 72. Okay, so a couple takeaways from that. Um, lobotomies are an example of a treatment that have a biological theory behind them. And the biological theory behind lobotomies is that psychopathology is caused by difficulty regulating and controlling emotions which is actually not untrue, and that the part of the brain that's involved in regulating and controlling emotions is the prefrontal, or the frontal lobe and the prefrontal cortex, which is the very front part, um, which the ice pick or the um, lobotomy instrument affected. That's true too, as I said, the prefrontal cortex, and as they said in the video, is involved in impulse control and regulating emotions, and it's the reason that we don't act on all of our emotional impulses. So the theory behind lobotomies was that emotions sort of live in this part of the brain and that by damaging this part of the brain, we would turn down emotions. That was not true. Emotions don't have any one part of the brain where they originate, but now we know that the amygdala, which is deeper inside the brain um, towards the middle, is actually responsible for um, initiating a lot of emotional reactions that we have. And again, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. And the prefrontal cortex is actually in charge of controlling those emotions. So this is an example of a biological theory that was wrong and it led to really disastrous treatment. As I mentioned here, um, Howard Dulley, his life was less affected by it. Um, his life was probably more affected by the child abuse and neglect that led to him being lobotomized in the first place. But because he was young, um, his brain was not permanently damaged by this. Younger brains are more plastic, which means that they're more able to change and regrow connections. When lobotomies were done to adults, it often led to them um, really losing a lot of their intellectual functioning and becoming, ironically, often more impulsive, more emotional, more difficult to kind of control. Um, so, let's see. Okay, so that being said, um, the biological treatments with a flawed understanding have led to a lot of damage in the past, but we are still using biological treatments today. Um, so one example is electroconvulsive therapy, which is depicted in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest um, as kind of this like medieval torture that was inflicted on mental patients by evil doctors and nurses. Um, actually, today, electroconvulsive therapy is sort of a last resort treatment or almost last resort for really severe depression that doesn't respond to other less invasive treatments that we have. Um, back in the day, electroconvulsive therapy was often done without sedatives. Now, um, it's usually done under full anesthesia. And it's portrayed as, kind of, as like electrocuting someone and causing them to convulse and twitch. Actually, what it's doing is just sending electrical currents into the brain to sort of disrupt the natural electrical currents that regulate all brain activity, and that causes a seizure. So it's a medically controlled seizure, and it's actually been shown to really help severe depression 
somewhat in the short term. It really improves people's moods for like a couple months after the procedure, but then they often have to come back and have it done a couple more times. So an even more invasive and even more last resort treatment than ECT electroconvulsive therapy is um, implanted deep brain stimulators. So these are used um, in cases where there's brain damage. So Parkinson's disease involves um, degeneration of the substantia nigra, which is a part of the basal ganglia where dopamine is produced. And dopamine from that region of the brain, from the basal ganglia, is involved in initiating movement. And people with Parkinson's disease, as their brain stops producing dopamine, um, start being unable to control their movements. They be their movement becomes kind of jerky, they have tremors, they sometimes freeze in place. So psychosurgery to implant a deep brain stimulator in the basal ganglia can help those cells to produce more dopamine and it can alleviate the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Um, psychosurgery is also used in treatment refract refractory depression. That means depression that doesn't respond to any other treatment, including electroconvulsive therapy. And there is a suggested reading about um, deep brain stimulation for severe depression in the end of this slide set. So by far the most common biological treatment we're using today and often one of the frontline treatments, one of the first treatments that we offer for psychopathology is psychotropic drugs. So psychotropic drugs are based on the biological theory that the origins of symptoms of the four Bs is imbalances in our neurotransmitters. We're gonna talk more about neurotransmitters in the next lecture. But basically neurotransmitters are the ways that cells in our brain communicate with other cells in the brain and with cells in the body. So neurotransmitters are kind of the language of the brain. And one biological theory, for example, of depression is that depression is caused by inadequate signaling of serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter that's involved in emotion. So the theory is that people are depressed because their brains are not producing enough serotonin or they're not using the serotonin that they produce efficiently enough. So there's a deficit in serotonin signaling. And antidepressants are also called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and they work by increasing the amount of serotonin that's available in the brain. So psychotropic drugs are based on biological theories, and they target a biological, a specific biological region, in this case, a specific neurotransmitter. Um, other categories of psychotropic drugs are anxiolytics, which often target the um, GABA neurotransmitter, antipsychotics, which often target dopamine, stimulants, which also target dopamine, but whereas antipsychotics help to reduce the amount of dopamine, stimulants increase it. Um, psychedelics are a psychotropic drug, and actually they're starting to be used in treatment of things like depression um, and PTSD. So drugs like ketamine um, and MDMA or ecstasy. And then opioids, which target opioid receptors in the brain. So as I just said, and as I'll talk more about in the next lecture, psychotropic drugs either mimic or modify the action of neurotransmitters in the brain. And the idea is that that influences um, biological, physical processes in the brain that in turn influence emotions and behavior. So this is a simulation of what modern electroconvulsive therapy looks like. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, is often called a treatment of last resort for patients who haven't had success with drug therapy, who have life-threatening psychiatric conditions, or who are suffering a catatonic state. ECT induces a brief seizure in a patient which resets the brain functions associated with some psychiatric disorder. Typically indicated for treatment-resistant psychiatric conditions. Uh, with commonly new disorders or depression, but there are multiple types of depression, so it can also be used to treat bipolar depression. The majority of ECT treatments are managed like outpatient procedures, and the patient is given general anesthesia. When the patient's asleep, uh, the stimulus is delivered, uh, the seizure is monitored, they'll have just one seizure. An electrical current is given to the brain, low enough not to harm the patient, but high enough to trigger a seizure. The treatment team can even touch the patient. The thing that concerns patients the most is that they know that they will be having a seizure. They're concerned about what may be happening while they're either asleep or while they're having that seizure. 
uh, thanks to the anesthetic, uh, it, it's very hard to tell. In fact, the only, only way you can truly tell if they're having a seizure or not is to kind of monitor the motor uh, activity and then monitor the EEG activity. The patient awakens soon after and is monitored for a short while like any patient who has undergone general anesthesia. Within a half hour, they'll be discharged. In some cases, a handful of ECT treatments may be all that's needed to make medication therapy work. For other patients, regular recurring ECT treatments may be needed. In Morgantown for the WVU Health Report, I'm Dr. Raleigh Sullivan. So ECT treatments can also help make um, psychotherapy work, not just medications. And um, actually this video, what ECT is like, is one of the recommended further readings slash viewings um, this is someone who undergoes ECT regularly for schizoaffective disorder, which is a mood disorder that involves um, psychotic symptoms. Okay, I'll get the hang of that eventually. Okay, so that was a very fast overview of biological models of psychopathology um, from some of the earliest origins in ancient Greek medicine to biological treatments that are still in use today. Um, now we're going to talk about psychological models, which again, also are still in use today. Um, the psychological, our psychological understanding of psychopathology has a more recent history than our biological understanding. Um, but I do think it's important to emphasize that throughout history, um, people have sort of thought of there being a separation between mental and physical. So a difference between the brain, which is the biological, physical organ, and the mind, which is consciousness and thoughts and emotions and sensation. Um, I would say that a lot of my colleagues who are neuroscientists would say that all of those things, consciousness, sensations, emotions, thoughts, all of that does have a biological basis, and I agree with that. But from a clinical perspective, when you're treating an actual person and trying to help them understand their symptoms, um, most people don't think of their emotions as neurotransmitters. They think of them as sort of a separate process that isn't purely physical. Um, so the psychological theory of mental illness is at the 40s, distress, dysfunction, um, danger, and deviance in behavior are caused by mental and emotional and cognitive processes. So a little history of the origins of modern psychological understandings. Um, we talked about Hippocrates and Galen in the Middle Ages, how the humoral theory was really influential. But um, beginning in the Renaissance, so in the 1400s, um, and going continuing through the 18 and 1900s, um, modern science started to take a really biological view of psychopathology. So the images here are anatomical illustrations of the brain. The top one was by Leonardo da Vinci in the 1400s, and the bottom one is from the 18th century, or the 19th century, 1800s. So by 19th century Europe, so by the 1800s, biological models of psychopathology were really dominant, and most medical understanding of the time was really strongly rooted in anatomy. Um, the medical tools that were available at the time it was hard to look at processes happening in living bodies in real time. So most medical knowledge and most psychological knowledge of the time was based on dissection of dead bodies or vivisection of animals. So um, when the biological model of mental illness was dominant and especially once sort of the industrial revolution happened, um, people were living in cities, population density was increasing capitalism was really dominant and people's daily life was kind of defined by their ability to work for other people. Um, the societal response to mental illness became institutionalization. So people who were mentally ill didn't fit into this industrial society that was developing in Europe and America. So, and biological treatments, although these behaviors were believed to have a physical origin in the brain, biological treatments weren't very good at actually changing behavior. They knew that something was going on in the brain, but they didn't know how to target it in a way that actually helped people and changed behavior. So whereas historically in Europe and America, um, people with mental illness lived at home and were taken care of by their families, during the Industrial Revolution and by the 19th century, most family members 
uh, including women, were working um, either in the house or outside the house and weren't able to take care of family members who couldn't take care of themselves. So because in part of this perception that mental illness really wasn't treatable, um, people were often encouraged to sort of take their mentally ill family members to institutions and just sort of abandon them and move on with their lives. So that led to really poor conditions and overcrowding in mental hospitals around this time. So that set the stage for the moral therapy and mental hygiene movement. Um, yeah. So moral therapy was basically just a reform movement that was happening in the 19th century for better treatment of institutionalized people. And there was sort of a social psychological model behind it based on the observation that when institutionalized people were living in clean conditions, when they were treated humanely and with respect, when they were allowed to have dignified work and social relationships, their mental illness actually improved and their functioning improved. They did better when they had better living conditions. So based on that observation and the psychological um, model of mental illness, that mental illness is really about relationships and having a, a positive environment. The moral therapy approach to treatment was that people who are institutionalized with mental illnesses should be allowed to live in as normal an environment as possible and be integrated into society as much as possible. Um, the mental hygiene movement kind of built on that and Dorothea Dix was um, an American woman in the 19th, um, 19th century who was really influential in the mental hygiene movement. And it built on the observations behind the moral therapy movement that humane treatment, good living conditions, social relationships were important to further emphasize a need that a need for um, clinicians who are treating institutionalized people to understand normal functioning, normal human behavior, and how these patients differed from that, to try to understand normal typical development and how that development might go awry to lead to some of the four Ds in behavior. Um, and to really have an understanding of patients' emotional and cognitive experiences. So this was one of the early psychological theories of mental illness, that deviant dysfunctional behavior was really influenced by the environment and that you could intervene on it by intervening on a person's environment, on their relationships, and on the way that they think and the way that they feel emotionally. So, Probably the most dominant psychological um, theory in psychological history was um, Freud's psychoanalytic theory. So this theory has been really influential in popular culture in sort of like a lay person's understanding of clinical psychology. So a lot of what Freud believed didn't really have a scientific basis. Um, his methods were not experimental. They weren't scientific. They were very sort of theory driven and the way that he treated people, his um, interventions didn't have any scientific basis and it's not something that we would do today. Um, but a lot of his observations of human behavior were sort of on the right track. And a lot of the influence he had on the field of clinical psychology was positive in that he really felt that mental illness was treatable, that you had to understand who someone was as a person and develop a relationship with them to help them improve their way of thinking and their way of relating to other people, which would in turn improve their functioning. And that is pretty close to a modern clinical psychologist's understanding of most psychopathology. Um, another thing that Freud emphasized that sort of remains important in clinical psychology is develop development. So this idea that humans, as they grow up and mature, are learning new things, um, building new kind of mental and cognitive structures in their brain. And that early childhood environment, so like the physical environment that kids are growing up in, but importantly, parenting and the way that their parents relate to them and treat them early in childhood really has an influence on the development of their personality and on their subsequent risk for mental illness. And that observation was definitely true according to our modern understanding of psychology. So um, also just to note, Freud himself, he did kind of practice what he preached in that he seems like he was a really good dad. 
by sort of modern standards. Um, he had daughters. He had, this is his daughter, Sophie. He also had a daughter, Anna, who became a psychoanalyst herself. Um, and yeah, Freud was a really good dad. And for his time, he really seemed to respect his daughters as intellectual beings, um, which was sort of somewhat rare for women at the time. So one of the most well-known aspects of the psychoanalytic theory is the three-part structure of the mind. So the idea is that humans have sort of three drives that govern our behavior and decision-making. The first one is the id. We're born with it. It's unconscious, so we're not like cognitively aware of it. It's animalistic, um, so it's really oriented towards getting pleasure and gratification. And it's emotional. The id, this animalistic side of human nature, is the source of our emotions. So children are born with an id, and then the ego and superego have to develop over time through socialization and parenting. The ego was thought to develop first. This is kind of the rational mind. So the part of our mind that we have conscious access to, where we think things through, where we make decisions, where we decide whether or not to seek pleasure. Um, the id, it's not a choice. It just drives you to do that. The ego is how you kind of decide when it's appropriate to seek pleasure and when it's appropriate to do other things. And then Freud thought that the superego developed later. The superego was partially conscious, but partially it was just sort of ingrained morality and social norms. Um, the superego is kind of a person's moral compass. But Freud is also really big on people integrating into their social role, including gender roles and class roles. So the superego is also part of that. Freud considered a well-adjusted person to be someone who accepted the, the role that society gave them. And that was one of the things that the superego did. So um, Freud's psychoanalytic theory was also very developmental. And Freud believed that sexual drives had a really big influence on human development and human behavior. So Freud believed that there were five stages in human development that people passed through from birth until around puberty, around adulthood. Um, and Freud believed that each stage represents where a person's life energy, where their drive, where their main interests, he called it libido, which meant more than just sex, but it also did mean sex, where their libido was focused um, for that stage. So he believed that normal development started with the oral stage um, from birth to around one year old. Infants' libido, their life force, their sexual drive is focused on nursing and on putting stuff in their mouth. So this is accurate. Um, babies do actually learn a lot by putting things in their mouth. We'll talk about that during the feeding disorder lecture for sure, but maybe sooner. Um, but the mouth is a really sensitive area. Uh, we have a lot of um, nerve endings on our tongues. So babies do learn about the world by putting stuff in their mouth, and it is actually important for their development. So Freud was right about that. Um, next comes the anal stage um, from one to three years, where the main focus of children's development is toilet training, becoming continent. And again, it's true that that is the age when, when children do that, when children become capable of controlling their bowel movements and bladder. Next comes the phallic stage. This is where Freud thought children became aware of their genitals for the first time and started to develop a very early gender identity. And he was right about that too. Um, we, do, we now know that gender identity does develop for most people around this age, between three and five years. And it's also really normal for kids this age to be very like focused on gender and to sort of want to say like, I'm a girl and these are girl Legos and this is girl clothes and you're a boy and you do different things. Differentiating your gender from other genders is normal development in this age group. Freud had some theories about um, how children related to their genitals and their parents' genitals that haven't been proven, that are not really accurate. Um, the Oedipus complex was the idea that boys envied and feared their father's genitals and were jealous of their father's relationship with their mother. Freud also believed in um, penis envy, so the idea that when girls realized they didn't have a penis, they felt bad about it and wanted one because Freud thought that everyone should want a penis, that obviously penises were superior. Um, again, that doesn't really have a role in modern clinical psychology, but emerging gender identity does. 
Next comes the latency stage. So this is what modern psychologists would refer to as middle childhood. Um, it's the age when kids are in elementary school. And again, Freud was correct that kids don't develop very much during this stage physically. Um, they might get a little bit taller, but their bodies kind of stay the same from about six to nine years old before puberty starts. Um, so Freud believed that there wasn't a lot of psychosexual development happening in this stage. And again, he was right that there's not a lot of physical maturation happening in this stage, but there is a lot of learning and socialization happening. And then the last stage that Freud did not believe everyone successfully reached, but that typically developing well-adjusted people reached by adulthood was the genital stage. So in contrast to the phallic stage, in the genital stage, women were believed to accept that they don't have penises and accept their own genitals. And the genital stage was all about developing adult sexuality and um, embracing your gender roles and your social roles. So gender in class. And again, um, Freud's observations were somewhat accurate in that at the time he was a middle, up middle to upper middle class Victorian white man and people in his social circle definitely were more well adjusted and probably happier when they accepted their lot in life because in that society roles were really fixed and their social role was unlikely to change. That doesn't mean that rigid social roles are good for people. Um, and arguably in societies where social roles are a little bit more flexible, um, it's probably easier for more people to be happy and well adjusted. But Freud's observation was correct that clashing with your assigned social role or with your assigned gender role does create a lot of distress and dysfunction for people. Okay. So Freud's psychological theory of psychopathology had to do with fixation. The idea was that if your development got interrupted during one of those stages, you became fixated in that stage. You got stuck there and you didn't develop normally through the other stages. Um, Freud's theory of fixation was kind of general. The idea was that fixation affected your personality and it was kind of a general risk factor for psychopathology to be fixated. And that observation is actually consistent with modern psychology too, not the fixation part, but with the idea of non-specific general risk factors. We now understand that certain personality types like people who are highly neurotic or people who have really strong emotions or who have a lot of difficulty regulating their emotions, um, those people are at risk for a variety of forms of psychopathology. We now know that there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship between psychological or biological risk factors for psychopathology and specific mental disorders. So again, Freud was sort of right about that. But he was probably not right that, for example, um, infants whose mothers weren't responsive enough during the oral stage became orally fixated and became adults who did things like bite their nails or abuse alcohol or overeat, so things that like satisfied oral urges. That probably doesn't have its origin in breastfeeding but Freud thought it did. So Freud's treatment, which we'll talk about more on the next slide after I have some water, had to do with identifying maladaptive defense mechanisms that people developed to deal with their fixations and to deal with conflicts between themselves and their prescribed social roles and to process their unconscious desires so that they could sort of work through them in a more healthy way. Okay, so as I said, most of Freud's um, actual theories and practices aren't mainstream anymore. They're not really supported by modern evidence, but um, there are people who still practice psychotherapy that's based in some Freudian theories. Modern application of um, psychoan psychoanalytic psychotherapy is called psychodynamic psychotherapy. And unlike psychoanalysis, which could go on for years, it wasn't focused on improving symptoms or functioning. It was, improved, it was focused on improving personality. Um, and it didn't have a clearly defined goal. So the, the goal wasn't like get rid of anxiety symptoms, get rid of depression symptoms. It was identify someone's fixation and help them go through all the stages of development. Psychodynamic psychotherapy is short-term, it's problem-focused, so it's focused on improving social anxiety or improving depression. 
and some of the techniques that are used in psychodynamic psychotherapy have to do with helping people learn to express their emotions appropriately and stop avoiding emotion. The idea behind psychodynamic psychotherapy is that a lot of distress is caused by sort of suppressing emotions or not properly allowing yourself to feel emotions. There's also a focus on interpersonal relationships. So Freud observed that relationships during development are really important, and that's true. So psychodynamic psychotherapy focuses on um, improving how people relate to other people in their life. And sometimes they do this by using as an example how the patient relates to the therapist. And also psychodynamic psychotherapy will consider unconscious processes to some extent, like they might interpret dreams or fantasies in terms of how those might relate to the person's tendency to avoid emotions and how that relates to the person's symptoms. So we're going to talk about this in more detail when we talk about personality disorders. And we're actually going to be talking with a friend of mine who is a psychodynamic researcher and psychotherapist who studies personality disorders. Okay, we're almost done, guys. I think we have like five more slides left. But moving forward in time, um, psychoanalysis was really dominant through from like the late 1800s through the 60s and 70s in America. But um, starting around the 40s, maybe a little bit before, and really being dominant through the 70s was the humanistic school of psychotherapy. And whereas Freud thought that humans are at their base, these like animals with like aggressive and sexual drives that have to be controlled by the person and by society, humanists thought that people are intrinsically good, that under the right conditions, everyone would be a good person, everyone would just strive to better themselves and to help other people. And humanists really focus on finding those conditions and helping the person create those conditions for themselves. And the basis of humanism is basically everybody, every human being, just by virtue of being a human, deserves fulfillment and safety and happiness. And one really important observation that humanists need is illustrated here. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this little colorful pyramid. And Maslow recognized that humans, that in order for humans to be psychologically healthy, they have to have certain physical needs met. So before you can even really address someone's depression or someone's anxiety, you have to address their physiological needs first, their basic survival, things like air, shelter, food, sleep, um, just like basic human needs. And then next you have to address more of their social needs. So maybe they have shelter, but it's not secure shelter. Maybe they um, have food, but they're getting it from a food bank and they don't have a job. You need to address their safety needs before a person can really start to feel capable of self-actualizing. So humanism was really unique, but it kind of calls back a little bit to the moral therapy movement in that it really recognized that humans live in a society. We, um, we need to be safe, we need to be fed, we need to have relationships with other people, we need to have fulfilling jobs and roles in society before we can ever be psychologically healthy. And biological theories don't tend to take that into account and Freud didn't really take that into account because Freud's view of psychology was really narrowly focused on the psychology of middle-class people. And humanism recognized that everyone has psychology, um, but for some people, their unmet physiological needs makes it difficult for them to really express their emotional needs. So modern humanism. Um, in the 40s there, and through 70s, there was um, experimentation with humanism as a treatment for the 40s. So the person-centered therapy movement basically involved minimal interaction with the therapist. The therapist wasn't doing anything to people. The idea was that if you give people a safe space to express themselves, let them talk, show them unconditional positive regards, so show them that you respect them as a person, that you value them as a person, that will create an environment where that person will be able to solve their own problems. So it'll um, help to address their needs for love and belonging and esteem, and that will help them reach self-actualization. So humanism and person-centered therapy doesn't actually work as a standalone treatment for psychopathology. And I think we can sort of understand why that's true. Because I think we can all think of examples of people who have their physiological and safety needs met for sure, and who have great relationships, love and belonging, who have jobs that they really care about, so they have esteem, but they still struggle. Um, so those are 
that psychological explanation isn't enough to explain the four Ds. And so therefore it's not enough to treat them. But humanistic principles are used today in counseling psychology, which is kind of a companion branch to clinical psychology. So whereas clinical psychology focuses on treating symptoms and improving functioning in people with psychological disorders, counseling psychology really helps people without psychological disorders navigate kind of normal life hurdles and reach fulfillment, reach their goals. And humanistic principles are really used today in counseling psychology. Okay, so guys, behaviorism is really important and we're gonna talk about it a lot. Um, I'm getting a little bit breathless. I'm gonna take a drink again. Okay, so humanism was becoming popular in like in the 40s. Um, behaviorism was really a response to the trauma of World War II. Um, not just a response to World War II, but it became really popular after World War II because it, it helped to explain how something like that could happen, how um, an entire country could persecute and murder its citizens. And the idea there is that basically humans are animals. Um, we share most of the same physiology. We have really similar brains. So the idea was that if you can understand what influences animal behavior, how you can get animals to, to do things, you can understand how we get humans to do things too. And you can explain human behavior in a way that doesn't require you to say that an entire culture of people, an entire country, the Germans are bad people. They were just living in an environment that influenced their behavior and made them do bad things. So one of the key principles in behaviorism is that, again, humans are animals and humans and animals learn about the world around them by noticing events that occur together. So we learn about our environments by noticing, you know, when the sun is in the middle of the sky, it's really hot out. Maybe that means that I shouldn't go outside at that time of day. Or when I ate the red berries on that bush, I got a stomach ache. So red berries cause stomach aches and I probably shouldn't eat those red berries again. Um, so one of the types of stimuli that we notice in our environment is unconditioned stimuli. These are things that have inherent meaning or value. So again, getting a stomach ache is an example of an unconditioned stimulus. Having a stomach ache is inherently negative. You don't have to learn that it's a bad thing. You just know. Um, other examples of unconditioned stimulus, unconditioned stimuli are food. So you don't have to learn that you need to eat. You just intrinsically need to eat. And you also don't need to learn that you like sex. Most people just naturally like sex. So unconditioned stimuli are things that have inherent meaning, but when we notice that unconditioned stimuli tend to co-occur with other things in the environment that don't necessarily have an intrinsic meaning, we can learn that those two things are related. So for example, eating the red berries gives you a stomach ache. The stomach ache has an intrinsic value, but red berries don't necessarily. They don't acquire any value until they're paired with an unconditioned stimulus like pain. And that pairing of red berries, redness, and pain creates a conditioned association where you learn through experience, through pairings in the environment, that red berries cause pain and therefore you should avoid them. So behaviorism can explain a lot about not just psychology, but things like um, reading and symbols. So the letter A, for example, it doesn't intrinsically mean anything. It doesn't mean the sound ah. It's a symbol that we've learned to pair with that sound. And now when we see that symbol, we don't have to think about it. It just automatically clicks with us that that's what that symbol means. So th these are other examples of symbols that have acquired meaning through pairings with unconditioned stimuli, things that have intrinsic value. So like hypodermic needles, if you had never seen one before, you might not know that it was an uncomfortable experience until that needle has been paired with pain for you. Okay, so the thing about behaviorism is that of all the theories that we've talked about so far, behaviorism is the best at explaining a lot of psychopathology. So an example of this is Freud's Little Hans case study. Little Hans was the, the child of a friend of Freud's who had a pathological fear of horses. So Hans and his family lived across the street from a stable. And every time his parents tried to take him out the front door, Hans would freak out whenever he saw a horse and his parents would have to take him back inside. And it was really causing a lot of dysfunction in the family 
causing distress for Hans because there were horses everywhere. It was causing distress for his parents. It was deviant because at the time horses were cars, so they were everywhere. It would be like you being afraid of cars today it would really get in the way. And um, so those three of the four Ds caused Hans's parents to seek out treatment. And they did that by writing to Freud. So Freud's explanation for Hans's fear of horses was that he was having a problem with the phallic stage of development because he was like three or four when, when the fear started. So Freud thought that the fear of horses coincided with Hans starting to show an interest in his own genitals, which is really developmentally normal, um, and his emerging gender identity. And Freud believed that Hans had displaced his, in Freud's opinion, developmentally normal fear of his father his um, Oedipus complex into a fear of horses because to Hans, that fear of horses was more acceptable to him than fearing his father, who he loved. So the fear of horses was a defense mechanism for Hans. It was helping him process the fact that he was scared of his dad without having to deal with the like emotional fallout of actually consciously being afraid of his dad. So that's the psychoanalytic take on why this little boy was afraid of horses. The behaviorist take um, was that for Hans, like they were for most people, because most of us aren't afraid of horses, horses were a neutral stimulus. So they don't have an in intrinsic meaning. They're not necessarily good or bad, they just are. We have to learn about them. We have to learn about them through pairings with experiences to know kind of how we feel about them. So an important part of Hans's history was that in addition to being interested in his penis around this age, he also had a really bad experience with a horse. Um, he was out walking with his nanny in the street and a cart horse had a heart attack and like convulsed and died in front of him. So seeing that death um, and probably seeing the reaction of adults around him being upset was really scary for Hans. So that experience, seeing a horse die, was an unconditioned stimulus. It had intrinsic emotional value. It was upsetting. And it was paired with a horse, which before this didn't have any value, but after this, became associated for Hans with the unconditioned stimulus of death and the unconditioned response he had to that stimulus, being startled, being scared, being upset. And that pairing led him to develop a phobia. So the behaviorist take on this also implies a pretty straightforward treatment, which is expose Hans to horses and let him learn that most of the time they don't keel over and die in front of you and most interactions he would have with horses would be positive or neutral. So we talked about classical conditioning. That's where you learn to associate two objects in the environment, one of them unconditioned, so it has a natural value, and the other conditioned. It takes on the value of the unconditioned stimulus that it's paired with. The other type of conditioning is operant conditioning, which is um, conditioned behavior. So classical conditioning is just learning an association and having an emotional or physiological response. Operant conditioning is the next step. It's learning an association and producing an intentional behavioral response to get either a reward, so get something that you want out of the environment, or avoid a punishment, um, so avoid something negative happening. We'll talk more about operant conditioning, I believe, in the next lecture. Um, but basically, operant conditioning is what you're doing when you train a dog. So say that you have a dog and you want to train it to sit on command. You want it to learn the word sit which has no inherent meaning to a dog, means if I sit down, I get a treat. So you say sit, you push on the dog's butt, it sits down and you give it a treat. The dog is learning that if I sit when someone says sit, I get a reward, I get a treat. So the next time I want a reward and someone says sit, I'll sit down on my own. I'll do it before they have to push my butt down and then I'll get a reward for my behavior. So training an animal uses operant conditioning. Okay, so this um, is a, a video clip from the office that illustrates um, a behaviorist principle. Is this a working clip? Oh darn. It's not. That's cool, we'll just go to YouTube. Watching Karate Kid 2 last night. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, let's reboot again. Wait, do you want an output? What do you think? In school, we learn about this scientist who trained dogs to salivate at the sound of a bell by feeding them whenever a bell rang. So for the past couple of weeks, I've been conducting a similar experiment. What? One open. Okay. Alton? Sure. Thank you. Feel free. What are you doing? I, what? I don't know. I, my mouth tastes so bad all of a sudden. Oh. Okay. So that is an example of a type of conditioning. And, oh, it did work. Okay, well, then you can watch the video again in the slides if you want. Um, so if this was a live class, I would be asking you right now if you think that this is classical conditioning or operant conditioning. So Jim did an experiment on Dwight where he um, made the computer turning off sound, which is like a, a dinging noise. And then every time he did that, he offered Dwight an Altoid. So after he did this many, many times, um, he one time didn't offer the Altoid and Dwight put out his hand anyway. So this is kind of both, actually. Um, the classical conditioning part of it is that Dwight learned to associate that computer sound with getting an Altoid. And he had a physiological reaction to the computer sound. He said his mouth tasted bad. Um, he was probably salivating. So there was classical conditioning. Um, that sound, which was neutral, it didn't mean anything to Dwight before, became paired with getting an Altoid. And so the sound itself started to cause the same physiological reaction that the Altoid caused. Um, salivating and sort of feeling like you need to clean out your mouth. Um, there was an operant part too though when he reached out. So reaching out is an intentional behavior and that behavior in the past had been rewarded. When he reached out in the presence of that bell noise, he got an Altoid. So this was both classical and operant conditioning. And it can sometimes be a little confusing which is which, but basically the thing to remember is that classical conditioning is when a neutral stimulus takes on the same emotional and physiological value as a stimulus that has inherent meaning. Whereas operant conditioning is when you learn to perform a behavior in order to get a reward or avoid punishment. But often they go together. So like in the dog training example, the dog doesn't learn that anytime it sits down, it gets a treat. It learns that when it sits down in the presence of the cue, the word sit, then it gets a treat. So the operant part is the intentional behavior of sitting, but the classical conditioning part is the association between the word sit and getting a treat if it sits down. Okay, we're almost there, we're at the finish line. So behavioral theories really do a good job of explaining a lot about mental, mental illness. Um, in particular, behaviorism really explains both how, both the development and the maintenance of anxiety disorders, of trauma-related disorders, of OCD. And we'll talk about the behavioral theory of all of these disorders in the lectures devoted to them, because those, are, those theories are still really dominant in our understanding. Um, but in the next lecture, we'll talk about the difference between unidimensional and multidimensional models of psychopathology. But the main takeaway is that humans are really complicated. Psychopathology is really complex. And no unidimensional model, no one thing can explain all human behavior. So behaviorism is really powerful in explaining human behavior. It's both a biological and a psychological theory um, in that it has to do with both physiological reactions and mental processes. It sort of ties them together. So it's already moving towards integration, but it's unidimensional and there's other aspects to our modern understanding of psychopathology. Um, the first one is thoughts. So humans are conscious. We're aware of our thoughts. We tell ourselves stories to explain our own behavior. And those stories aren't usually behavioral. Even if conditioned associations and environmental reinforcement actually explain a lot of our behavior, that's not our explanation for our behavior. It's not what we think we're doing when we're engaging in behaviors. 
So the way that we interpret our own behavior, the way that we make predictions and inferences about the world, the way that we relate to other people and the way that we interpret other people's behavior, all of that is cognitive and it doesn't, it's not adequately explained by behavioral principles. There's also biology. So as I said, um, there really is no distinction between brain and mind. All of these psychological processes are basically chemical and electrical reactions happening between our ears. So everything does have a biological basis in the brain. The reason that our that psychology today isn't 100% biological is mostly just because we don't have the tools to pinpoint all of the biological processes that are happening. So we have more tools than they used to. Um, we have more sophisticated tools than sticking an ice pick into someone's brain or bloodletting. And we think that those things are really barbaric because we've come a long way in our understanding since then. But we still have a really long way to go in our biological understanding. So for example, serotonin. We talked about how selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors target the serotonin system and make serotonin more available to our brain cells. Well, that's pretty specific. It's more specific than just sticking a thing in your brain and wiggling it around. But it's still too general because taking a pill affects serotonin in your entire brain. But probably the parts of the brain that are involved in depression are more specific than that. And we don't right now have a pill that can target just those regions. So when we take an antidepressant, it has effects that go way beyond whatever effects it's having on the serotonin system and our mood. So for example, SSRIs have sexual side effects. They reduce sex drive for a lot of people. They also affect appetite and they can cause weight gain. So all that to say that our biological understanding is not advanced enough that it can be the only understanding we have. And then lastly, um, as I said, humanism it doesn't work as a standalone treatment for psychopathology, but it's critical that we recognize that our patients are people living in a social context. And we really don't have a great chance of improving someone's psychological functioning if we can't improve their basic life first. Um, as psychologists, we need to think about whether people's basic needs are being met and either help them get those needs met or unfortunately, sometimes, recognize that those needs might not be met in our current society and try to help them cope. But either way, there needs to be a recognition that people need safety, they need security, they need respect and dignity, and all of those things are sort of prerequisites for treating psychopathology that aren't necessarily captured by just behavioral theories alone. It's also important to understand what people's values are when they come to therapy. Because again, psychopathology is about dysfunction. And part of dysfunction is that they're not meeting their goals in life. They're impaired in their social roles. They're impaired at work. They're impaired in their families. So it's important to understand what psychopathology has taken away from someone um, that helps to motivate them to actually engage in the sometimes difficult treatments to get their functioning back on track. OK, so in the next lecture, we're really going to focus a lot on integration, but this is just a preview because it's really important. So clinical psychology is a science. We study human behavior using scientific methods. And the goal of our study of human behavior is to better understand and come up with ways to treat mental illness. So the scientific method is essentially developing um, theories through hypothesis testing. So making informed guesses about the world and then doing experiments to see if those guesses are correct or not. And one example of um, scientific method in action to treat mental illness is the clinical trial. So the clinical trial is a scientific experiment that tests whether a treatment works or not by giving the treatment to one group of people and comparing their outcomes to another group of people who weren't given the treatment. Okay, so I'm going to just linger the video on this slide a little bit, but these are more questions to sort of ask yourselves as you study the textbook readings, the slide set, and today's lecture video. And if you are having trouble answering any of these questions, um, definitely bring it up on Thursday or in a future in-person class, or if you're not taking the class in person, bring it up online. And just to clarify, we'll talk about this on Tuesday, but Thursday's class is going to be online and synchronous for everyone. So ask all your questions about this lecture and the next lecture on Zoom on Thursday. Okay, and here's your further reading. So again, discussion posts are due this week. And you can do the discussion post on the lecture or reading if you want, or you can 
if you're curious about any of the things that we talked about, read a little bit further and write a discussion board post sort of summarizing or reacting to any one of these topics. All right, that is that. And we're gonna end right here.